thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be back at LCA, one of the most vibrant uh, conferences going. Now, this particular presentation lies at the intersection of two significant movements. On the one side, we have the free software movement and the very closely related but distinct open source movement. And on the other side, we have the accessibility movement, which is concerned with ensuring that software electronic documents and information, to use that rather bland term, is as accessible as it can be to people with disabilities and indeed to everybody universally. Uh, in fact, people speak of universal design quite often as much as they do of accessibility, especially in the research community that uh, thinks deeply about these matters. Now, to be more specific about this, what I'd like to discuss today is uh, a series of developments that have taken place in recent years, culminating with the release of Firefox 3 by Mozilla, that have made uh, Mozilla Firefox accessible uh, to people who require speech or braille user interfaces uh, using the Orca assistive technology under Linux. Uh, I'd like to begin with something of a historical introduction. The uh, early developments in this area were carried out in the early 1990s uh, in a project that was then called the Mercator Project and later came to be known as the Ultrasonics Project. I discussed it briefly in my LCA presentation last year. And essentially what happened was that uh, uh, various researchers centred on the Georgia Institute of Technology were interested in the question uh, of how you make uh, graphical user interfaces operating under the X-Window system uh, accessible to people who required screen readers, that is, uh, software that creates a parallel braille or speech-based user interface uh, derived from the user interface of the desktop environment and the running applications. Uh, the first uh, discovery which they made, and they published papers on this, uh, was that they weren't able to achieve a satisfactory solution by intercepting the X protocol, and they realised they needed to develop something uh, at a higher level, namely at the level of the user interface libraries which implement all of the, uh, the various objects that comprise a typical graphical user interface. And uh, they decided to modify those libraries and to introduce support for what they, what eventually came to be known as an accessibility API. Uh, an API that provides tool assistive technology which can be a screen reader or an on-screen keyboard or any particular access technology required by a person with a disability, uh, a hierarchical structure, a tree of objects which represent the desktop and the running applications together with all of the user interface components of those applications. And this was the approach which was uh, introduced by the Mercator project and which was later developed by uh, central participants in that project uh, and people who were involved in the accessibility community at the time, in particular Peter Korn and Willie Walker who went on to work with Sun Microsystems who implemented this in, uh, in Java, and then they turned their attention in more recent years to the known desktop. And uh, that's where they implemented it uh, in an architecture that I'll describe shortly. Uh, the reason why this is of interest for present purposes is that it's this accessibility solution that was developed for known uh, that Mozilla then made use of in enabling Firefox 3 to be accessible uh, under Linux. And so that's what we'll be demonstrating and discussing in detail today. And so we basically have uh, two central components of the accessibility side of things. I think you could uh, call it three if you want to include the assistive technology. Basically, uh, there's a library called the Assistive Technology Toolkit, ATK, which operates in process in the running application and it's a library that uh, people who are writing user interface widgets and uh, applications need to write to in order to ensure that their software is accessible by this technique. And then there's uh, a second component which is called the uh, Assistive Technology Service Provider Interface 
the ATSPI, and that uh, actually, when you when you start the GNOME Desktop, runs a daemon process that operates in the background, and it acts as an interface that handles all of the interprocess communication between the desktop environment running applications on the one side and your assistive technologies such as the Orca program that I'll be discussing shortly on the other side. And there's a, com there's a component called the uh, ATK to ATSPI bridge that uh, handles all of the interprocess communication which at present is a complex matter involving Cor Corba, Bonobo and such very known specific matters. Uh, there will be a version of it coming out uh, at some point that implements all of this in DBus and there are developers working on it at the moment. So I won't say much in this presentation about inter-process communication because at some point in the future all that will become obsolete. Now, uh, so we have this inter-process communication going on which allows the accessibility object tree that I was talking about earlier to be made available to uh, assistive technologies which then create uh, the alternate user interface and in particular we're talking about Orca here which actually supports three uh, user interfaces Braille using a, s a refreshable Braille display device uh, synthetic speech and large print so it can actually enlarge the screen display. Uh, I won't be demonstrating that particular aspect of it as I haven't set it up and I'm not greatly familiar with the details of it. But anyway, uh, Orca is actually implemented in Python. Uh, it was developed at, at Sun principally and it's now a standard component of the main desktop. For all of the software which I'm going to demonstrate today uh, is available from your local Linux distribution, in particular if you're running Debian or Fedora or Ubuntu, then uh, it should be not only available but basically working. So uh, Orca is a fairly large Python program and uh, what it does is to uh, establish itself, it um, sets up all of the oil level interfaces to the known speech services and to the Braille TTY software that drives the Braille display and then uh, it registers itself with uh, ATSPI which I described earlier and it registers itself to receive events and uh, the final step in its initialization process is uh, to invoke the ATSPI event loop at which point everything is all function calls that take place whenever events occur. Now the way uh, Orca is designed, all of the specific details about uh, how it handles such things as keyboard events and uh, accessibility API events generated by running applications, all of this is controlled by scripts. Uh, which are specific either to the application or to the user interface library which is being used in the application. And so in this particular case we'll be uh, using it with Mozilla Firefox and therefore there's a, a Gecko script written in Python that handles all of the interactions with Orca uh, regarding uh, Mozilla applications. Uh, that script by the way is about 700k of Python so it's fairly complicated. I think it's. A, I think you'd call that a fairly large Python script, wouldn't you? Uh, but right. Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, it's all written. So, uh, and to get to the point of this, then uh, the script actually the, the scripts for specific libraries such as Gecko are actually a subclass of a default script. So some of the functionality is inherited. And anyway, uh, what happens is that uh, an important function that Orca carries out is to keep track of what they call the locus of focus. So whenever uh, the focus changes uh, from one user interface control to another, um, Orca is notified through the ATSPI events and then it's able to make some queries to find out what the object in focus is and what its state is, what kind of object it is and it's able to provide uh, its speech and braille interface according to the, uh, the code 
in the script. That's basically uh, how it works. And uh, the way in which it operates on the Mozilla side of things, well, I haven't actually looked at the code. Um, Mozilla's rather complicated after all. Uh, but uh, they, uh, Mozilla have implemented their own internal accessibility API. And the reason for doing that is that they also want to support the accessibility APIs of other operating systems. And so there's a rather complicated infrastructure uh, that's been introduced into Mozilla by the developers to make all of that possible. So what happens then is that uh, you get a speech and Braille output that I'll be demonstrating afterwards uh, when you uh, invoke Firefox, both within its user interface and of the HTML pages. Uh, carrot navigation is used. So what that means is that if you, uh, if you want to run this, uh, when you invoke Firefox for, uh, for the first time with Orca loaded, it's a good idea to turn on uh, carrot navigation. Uh, F7, as I recall, is the function key that will do this. And uh, Orca is then responsible for controlling the carrot, and that is due to some limitations in Firefox with their uh, current navigation support. Apparently there's some rather complicated and nasty code uh, involved in it in Firefox that nobody associated with Mozilla wants to uh, modify because of its complexity. So for that reason, it turns out that the Orca developers had to implement quite a lot of the extra support they needed themselves. And in particular, even though in general terms, uh, keyboard navigation is something which would be handled by the application, and which is required to be handled by the application, in this particular case, uh, Orca developers wrote a whole series of extra keystrokes and key bindings uh, that enable you to navigate by headings and to move to previous and next list items, to uh, move around by row and column in tables, to move to form fields, and so on. The idea is that we take full advantage of the structure uh, of the HTML document in order to make it easy for the user who is relying on one-dimensional speech or a single line brow display uh, to navigate their way through the document. And so that's, uh, that's essentially how it works. Um, I don't know whether we're ready to demonstrate this yet because someone was coming to hook a few cables together. And if we're ready to go, I'll attempt to get this to work with the usual, uh, the usual qualification that applies to anybody who's trying to do a technical demonstration, right? I'll have the mic for you. Uh, yeah, the, the qualification about we're not totally sure it's going to work right. Uh, what's going on? Uh, it looks like the no, we're not getting speech at all. Terminal desktop configuration file icon text We should be. Web browser desktop configuration file icon text W. Screen reader slash magnify frame preferences button. X slash nautilus slash desktop frame web browser desktop configuration file icon. Yes, so all the audio is set up and it was working a few minutes ago, so. There we go. Right, let's have a look. Uh. 
one file, files table, name column header, all the on Saturday. Can you ask it to read the page or do something that you want to Welcome to LWN.net, 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 Let's have a look. Okay, can you make it say something? Open file, files table, name column header, all the on Saturday. Where are we now? We've lost. Let's have a look. Uh, open a file. Open file, files table, name column header, all the on Saturday. Yeah, that's right. So we want to be in LCA. Files table. Name column header, mail Saturday. We're on something, I don't... This is not good. X slash Nautilus slash desktop frame, web browser desktop configurate. Loading. This might be a bad adapter, maybe. Try Let's that. try that. I'm trying to get it to get us into a. Try now, please. Yeah, um, it says something about loading, and it's trying to load something. I don't. What? Oh. Yeah, that's okay. You want me to log right out and? I'm not sure why it's not working. Why don't Sorry. we just use the yeah, put the microphone on the other side? Yeah, that's what we'll do. Where did you get? Let's have a look. Let's run X again. Oh, they're just under the front here, are they? Yeah. Welcome to Orca. Orca screen reader slash look in frame preferences button. X slash not in a slash desktop. Web browser desktop configuration file. Welcome to about 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 colon page by sweet old link image eight is it open file files table name column header all the on Saturday C A files table it hasn't triggered the out of whatever it is yeah so it should be loading now should be but some reason location colon Yeah. Sorry about this. This has done this several times before it all works. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'll try the file once again. Okay, button. Open. Let's get right out of that. Okay, button. Open file. Okay, I'm going to do slash home slash JSON slash LCA slash index. Page references heading level one. There we go. Firefox features and key bindings link. So this is the page that has all the author key bindings on it that I'll just bring up. I hope. That just changed. Why is it not doing that now? Yeah, there, it there it goes. I think we're getting a document here anyway. This is this is the document we're talking about. So I'm going through the document by hitting. I can jump to the first table. And I can actually uh, move around the table. Well, I can move around the table cells uh, using those navigation keys. 
uh, in lines that would define the worker it's, uh, itself. Um, given all those problems, I won't move straight into the next part of the, of the discussion. Um, let me. Uh, I'll get back and see if I can get back in the room. Uh, if not, file again. Sort this out in a moment. Uh, let me explain uh, the, s the second part of this. Uh, I'd like to introduce the um, ARIA specification. Uh, and as I mentioned in the abstract to this presentation, there's a, a common theme that runs through this, uh, which is the idea of an accessibility API. And I wish to explain how this concept has been applied to make uh, JavaScript intensive web applications and websites more accessible. These are also implemented in uh, Firefox 3 uh, and works with the Orca assistive technology and so after this discussion I'll try to get that running. We should talk and it should work. Now essentially um, when, with regard to uh, web applications that implement their own user interface components using JavaScript, we have the same kind of problem that I described earlier uh, with making uh, user interfaces under the X window system accessible. Uh, and the difficulty is that, as I'll show at the end, uh, when we look at the source code for one of these examples, uh, JavaScript user interfaces uh, often don't use uh, the standard HTML components that you would find in, the, in an HTML document, the form controls in particular, and they implement their own user interface components using JavaScript with HTML that typically involves a lot of span and div elements with various attributes that are manipulated with JavaScript. And so the question arises as to how an assistive technology can find out what's happening in the user interface uh, given that the HTML document doesn't supply that information in the semantics of the HTML elements. And uh, that's the, one of the central problems uh, which the ARIA specification of the W3C was designed to solve. Basically, there are three types of difficulty which ARIA is intended to address. The first is the one that I just mentioned. The second is the lack in HTML of certain kinds of structures. Uh, so, for example, unless you're using XHTML2 or the HTML5 draft specification to implement your web content, uh, you can't, in any standard way, specify where uh, the navigational links are at the start of a web page so that somebody who's using Braille or speech-based navigation uh, can uh, move past them or uh, jump straight to them. And that's just one illustration of the kind of structure which is common on websites as they're actually written, uh, which HTML 4.01, and that's still essentially the same standard that's in use today, in spite of being uh, 11 years old now, uh, doesn't accommodate. And so for that reason, we have extra attributes in, in ARIA to do this. I should mention that ARIA is basically an extension that can be uh, consisting of attributes which can be added to uh, a document in any markup language, a host language such as HTML or XHTML, potentially SVG and other markup languages can be supported. And the idea is that you add these special ARIA 
accessibility attributes uh, to your HTML document and you make sure that your JavaScript code uh, changes them as required uh, in order to inform the assistive technology of what's going on. So the third kind of problem uh, that I should mention which ARIA is intended to, to address is solved by a feature known as ARIA Live Regions. And to illustrate the problem, uh, I think it's quite a good example. I didn't bring the example because um, it would take a bit longer to demonstrate, uh, but basically, and also it's a bit difficult to get out of it once you're in it. <laughs> but so the University of Manchester has a very nice test page, and I think this one's a really good illustration of the problem. And it was uh, designed as a test for various assistive technologies to find out how they handle uh, web pages that include JavaScript, which updates the page uh, after it's been loaded. And so uh, the particular case is one in which they have a, a textual description of a cricket match. Uh, and they update the cricket scores and various information uh, dynamically as uh, as it progresses, and uh, what happens is that the, the assistive technology can't determine when the updates have stopped. Uh, it has trouble keeping track of the focus. It doesn't know whether to read the updates or not, so it, by default it reads out everything all the time as it changes, which makes it very difficult if you want to browse through the document because of all the updates coming through continually. And so we need a mechanism uh, to prevent that kind of problem from uh, occurring. Uh, obviously with deletions there can be a problem as well. If you actually use some JavaScript code to delete an element from an HTML document, uh, then the assistive technology will receive deletion events. So it gets notified through the accessibility API that some deletions have taken place in the document object model of the document, uh, but there's no way to determine when they're finished or how significant they are or whether they should be uh, notified, whether the users should be notified of them. And so there's a feature um, known as, as I said, ARIA Live Regions, which is designed to allow additional attributes to be supplied that control the behaviour of the assistive technology when, um, when JavaScript applications start making uh, changes to the document. So with those kinds of features then we have a facility which provides us with the equivalent of an accessibility API for the web for JavaScript applications that are implemented in uh, a combination of JavaScript, CSS and some version of HTML. And that's the kind of technology that's intended to make uh, web applications as they've developed over the last several years are more accessible. Uh, the problem itself, of course, is rather an old one. Back in the late 90s we were talking about the problems of dynamic HTML. These days people talk about the problems of AJAX. The uh, industry terms have changed but the underlying issues haven't. So it's a, it's a very good thing, however, uh, that the uh, ARIA specification is being standardised by the W3C, but Mozilla was the first to implement it and that it works with the uh, Orca assistive technology that, we're, uh, that we have operating here. Now, uh, having explained that, there are a few residual issues that I would like to discuss towards the end of the presentation. Now, the first problem is perhaps a fairly obvious one, and it applies both to uh, the general accessibility interfaces under MIME and to uh, the ARIA attributes that need to be added to HTML. Uh, and the difficulty here is um, that the author of the uh, user interface library or the content of the web application actually has to supply the ARIA attributes and needs to make sure that they are modified appropriately when uh, the states of user interface components change under the control of JavaScript and when live regions are updated and so on in, in that particular case. And uh, obviously that's a certain amount of work for authors. To some extent it's inevitable but there are two directions in which uh, solutions have been found to make it a little bit easier. Uh, the first kind of solution is that there are actually JavaScript based user interface libraries. And some of these 
uh, such as Google's Web Toolkit, which I think is under the Apache 2 license, and Dojo, or Dojo, however you pronounce it, D-O-J-O, which is one that accessibility developers at IBM have been working on. Both of these uh, frameworks provide support for the ARIA attributes. So the idea is that if you use their standard you know, the interface components, then all of this should work in the same way that if you use standard GTK components, then all of the main accessibility infrastructure should work. So that's one way of solving the problem. Uh, there's a second solution, and I think, as uh, I understand it, TV Run and, and Charles Chen working at Google were the first to implement this. Uh, and they've implemented it in, uh, in a program uh, that they call Access Jax. And the idea is that you can use JavaScript bookmarks or uh, the Grease Monkey extension to Firefox to invoke this. Uh, and what they've done is to write uh, some code in JavaScript uh, that will determine which page, which web page you're loading, uh, and in particular they've implemented this for Google applications and for various other uh, websites that make extensive use of JavaScript uh, user interfaces. And the idea is uh, that their JavaScript code, when the page loads, uh, goes through the document and makes changes that add additional ARIA attributes and keyboard functionality to make the whole uh, web application more accessible. So it's a JavaScript program that dynamically modifies uh, the web content on the client side to improve its accessibility. And uh, there are other interesting ways of developing this. So for example, you could have, uh, obviously the JavaScript code to do this is hosted by Google, uh, and that means it can be entirely independent of the website that has the, uh, the user interface in it, and it could be potentially developed by the community. And as a result of that, uh, we have a general mechanism by which uh, people who are so inclined can make other people's websites uh, more accessible. And you can imagine some interesting uh, business opportunities for people who specialize in accessibility uh, of um, providing this kind of extension and this kind of functionality to clients' websites as well, of course, making those websites themselves uh, more accessible. So that's how uh, we try to get around the fact that uh, these accessibility features need to be implemented in the web content itself. Now, there are a few more meetings that I'd like to discuss before we close and we try a few more demonstrations. Uh, I was expecting a demonstration before to work correctly because I've tested it several times, but you know what demonstrations are like. We'll see how the ones at the end go. But uh, leaving that out of account for a moment, I'd like to mention briefly what's happening with uh, KDE and WebKit because those are both uh, related, obviously, WebKit is a descendant of KHTML. And if we're interested in, uh, in software that can render web pages and which supports the document object model and JavaScript and all of the APIs that are necessary to make modern uh, web applications work, uh, then as far as Linux is concerned, the two free and open contenders are Mozilla on the one side and WebKit on the other. And so naturally the question arises of whether the WebKit developer will implement in this. And indeed uh, I'm reliably informed from the appropriate mailing lists uh, that they are implementing it. Uh, it doesn't work yet, we can't run it yet, uh, but they're planning to implement both support for ATK uh, so that this will work with Orca and also planning, uh, implementing support for, for ARIA. So WebKit has a great deal of catching up to do in this area, uh, but evidently the developers are well aware of it and there are people working on it. Uh, also I should point out that when all of the accessibility infrastructure that I mentioned of ATK and ATSPI together with the Orca Assistive Technology are migrated to use DBUS, uh, then it will be possible for the uh, accessibility support that's built into QT uh, to operate uh, under Linux. And at that point there will be a possibility with a great deal more work that uh, KDE applications could become accessible. 
So if you're wondering why I'm focusing on man on the one hand and the rule of Firefox on the other, uh, the very short answer to that is that they're the only combination that work. And we need to uh, extend our appreciation to the excellent collaboration that has taken place between the Mozilla developers and the uh, Orca and MAM accessibility developers to make all of this possible. Because okay, so that's, well, that's actually a good time uh, to finish because I've basically covered everything that I wanted to cover. And so what that means is that we can have some questions and then I can try to run the uh, demonstration of what happens when you get some JavaScript uh, user interface components running with ARIA support and you try to uh, access them. Uh, by the way, there are, there are really two uh, important reasons why people implement all of this in, in JavaScript. I think the main uh, purpose of it is to be able to implement user interface components that aren't supported by standard HTML forms. And sometimes they want a degree of customization uh, of the user interface controls that you can't get with HTML. So that's why so many web applications are using these uh, JavaScript uh, encoded HTML plus CSS uh, frameworks to develop their user interfaces. So anyway, without further uh, extending this discussion, I'd like to open it for questions. Then we can look at a few demonstrations of this technology at the end. And, uh, and also in the, in the interlude after the session, if people would like to ask questions while we disassemble all the hardware here, you're welcome to come in and, and discuss it. So thank you very much for the, listening to the presentation side of it. And we'll uh, continue, as I've mentioned. Right, we've got one already. We've got a question already. Because of the distance, though, I'm going to ask you to come halfway down Thanks. Um, I was just going to ask, a recent discussion that came up on the Web Standards Group mailing list was uh, how screen readers handle DHTML uh, injections into the DOM tree. For example, when you're doing uh, a form validation, you're typing stuff into forms, like, a, for example, a username. Um, a lot of the glitzy new web applications like to check if that username is available and then give you an output automatically back. So the discussion was, how do screen readers handle this? And um, and it seems like they don't do it that well. So the idea was to uh, essentially wait until the entire form's completed, uh, still spit back the, um, the injected errors or messages, but then also provide the same errors and messages on a page reload, as in when the form is actually submitted. Um, do you know anything about how well Orca handles um, DHTML injections into the DOM tree? like that, then you're interested in, uh, at that point, you're interested in ARIA live regions. So that, that will work. How well it works if you don't provide support for it in your web content is something that would need to be tested. They're all interesting. Uh, I should say that Orca handles uh, dynamically updating HTML documents, I've been told by the researchers at, uh, at Manchester that their preliminary findings were that Orca was handling it better than some of the screen readers for that other operating system that have been tested. So uh, that's a good thing for us. Any other questions? Yep. Sorry, one just here first. I think I'll get over there. Yeah, I'm one of those web developers who's actually been asked to include in our next uh, CMS one of those fancy widgets, for, in our case, for instance, for a calendar for what's on information. So, and I've had a look at the kind of HTML, those things, the components generate, and they're pretty, they're actually, just looking at them, HTML is horrible, so I can imagine what it sounds like to you when you're screaming or tries to read it. I was wondering, do you have recommendations on the best way to do it is just to have an alternative style sheet with just plain HTML for a screen reader, or is there some way to make those components usable for you? Uh, he's talking about user interface components, right? Yeah. Well, uh, that's uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough in the presentation, but that's the sort of problem that ARIA is designed to solve. So, uh, if you look at the source code for 
one of the examples that I have here, it's, it's actually a whole lot of div elements and there's JavaScript there which creates the user interface control which is a checkbox and the ARIA attributes are added to these uh, HTML, div and span elements which inform the assistive technology that it's a checkbox and what its state is and then the JavaScript updates the ARIA attributes uh, when the state of the checkbox changes so that uh, the assistive technology is able to read that correctly. That's how it's done. One more question here. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I, uh, like everyone else, I like to uh, write my websites to work in Firefox, but uh, unfortunately the reality is a lot of people who are viewing our websites aren't enlightened and they're still using other browsers. Um, it depends on your uh, in it actually depends on your industry vertical that your particular application is targeting. And I guess my question just was, um, do you know whether any of those other browsers are planning on implementing these sort of uh, API? <coughs> Yes, so WebKit is planning to implement it. I don't know how far they are down the, the road of implementing it. Opera uh, interested. Uh, Microsoft have an implementation uh, in their very latest test release. Uh, I don't know how good it is because my interests are in Linux and not, not in other operating systems. But, uh, so it looks like just about everybody that's writing a widely used implementation is, is either implementing it or planning to implement it. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. Well, have, we, have you got something else to show us or have we got about uh, three minutes left? Okay. Well, maybe what we could do is, um, let's see how we go. I want to see if this is going to be any better behaved this time around. You still got three or four windows for saying about high schools. The first one of which is the disk. Yeah. The welcome to LW page that you got up. Okay. That's you want to come in. Was not like that then. Yeah, we'll get someone to just close that. The high school brain will be the outcome the outcome of the page. It's actually ended up at Linux Weekly News. I didn't go into that deliberately, so I don't know how that got there. <laughs> You've got an error about the mixer app, which was part of your group uh, You need the uh, Alto to do. How's that? Yep, you've got to clean this. Uh Web browser, let's go into Firefox again. Yep. Now let's try opening that file again. Open file location colon text. So nothing in the text last time, so we're in luck. So let's I'm going to give the E M O slash L C A slash index dot. Yep. This is called R specification, which I ain't going to do now. Yeah. That's again a checkbox example. This example is taken straight from the Mozilla website. So that says the checkbox is checked. And it's displaying on the bar display. Uh, Tri-state checkbox is interesting. It's a good example of why we implement uh, why they implement this in JavaScript because it actually HTML obviously has no support for tri-state checkboxes. And it's, you, you can change the state of this checkbox. What I'd like to do now, if we, if we actually get out of X, will we still you know, will we still be able to see what's going on, or do I have to stay? Let's see if we can try that. Yep. Are we out? We're into the console, and can you still see what's going on? Uh, no, <laughs> it's switched away from. If you if you ask it to output again to um to the. 
what is it? It's Alt FNF7. Let me press that and see if we can get it to. Yeah, we want to get from the console. Yep. Work? No, I don't think so. I think you may have to run a console inside X. Okay, I'll have to run a console inside. What we might do yep. is, is draw it to a close because we'll run out of time. Yep. And I'll just make a comment to it if I can. Right. Yep. Okay, folks, we are actually running out of time, but I'd just like to say that in spite of the fact that Jason hasn't been able to put this latest thing up on the screen or let us hear it, I don't think that matters at all, to be honest with you, because the way he's explained this in such a concise and easy to understand manner, and his knowledge on this subject is unbelievable, I think it's been a fantastic presentation, and I'm sure you will all agree with me and like to thank him accordingly.